Hello everyone, my name is Cesar Jiménez Navarro. I am a PhD candidate at the Institute National Polytechnic in Toulouse, and in this video, I would like to provide a general overview of the Buffet Dynamics by using the simulation data that I obtained during my PhD studies. The study case that you're looking at corresponds to a simulation around the B2C wing designed by the Salt Aviation under happy Buffet conditions. This flow scenario occurs in wings at transonic speeds when critical conditions are met, which typically depend on a combination of the free string Mach number and the flow incidence, also known as angle of attack. Its origin is directly linked with the unsteady nature of the wake instabilities and the complex interactions between the shockwave and the incoming boundary layer, also known as SVLI, which stands for shockwave boundary layer interactions. It is said that the SVLI are the biggest obstacle for the development of supersonic aviation since there isn't enough knowledge about this incredibly complex phenomena and how to deal with these harmful effects. Now, let's take a look at the lateral view of the wing. The transonic buffet consists in a self sustained cycle that causes the shockwave to move back and forth with certain frequency and amplitude. But why is this an undesired phenomena that we want to avoid or at least to delay its onset? In order to answer to this question, we need to understand that the normal force with respect to the flow direction induced over the wing, known as lift, is generated by the pressure difference between the upper and lower surfaces. If we do a cut on the wing and we plot the pressure over this slice versus the core was coordinate, we will get information about the lift magnitude and its distribution, which is indicated by the difference between the upper and lower curves. In this graph, we can see the instantaneous pressure distribution over the center line of the wing in two key moments. In blue, we have the case when the shockwave is at its most upstream location, while in red we have the case when the shockwave is at its most downstream location. The way to easily spot the presence of a shock is to look for the sudden increase of pressure in the pressure coefficient graph as it is indicated by these arrows. It is obvious that for the blue curve, there has been a substantial reduction in the area within the pressure coefficient curves, which means that there is a loss of suction caused by the upstream excursion of the shockwave. Since the motion of the shockwave takes place over time, it induces important variations in the lift force with the same frequency and an amplitude which is proportional to the buffet amplitude. The real danger of running into a situation with buffet is that these force variations occur at frequencies which are similar to the low frequency elastic modes of the wing, which can lead to critical structural vibrations or even failure due to fatigue. That's why transonic buffet is a topic of great interest in aeronautical research nowadays. It is crucial to understand its dynamics in order to alleviate its harmful effects or even prevent its onset. Many numerical and experimental studies have attempted to explain the underlying governing physics of Buffett, but there is still a need to go deeper in this area of knowledge. What we observe now is an experimental flow visualization by means of exchange photography, which permits to identify the regions where the flow density changes, like in the presence of a shockwave. I would like to thank Alessandro Daguano Pitch the candidate at TU Delft for letting me show you this video of his experimental studies on Buffett over the OAT-15 wing. In the video, we can clearly see the shock's movement, from which we can measure the amplitude and the frequency of the motion. Additionally, we can observe the state of the flow after the shock, which is switching between an attached and a fully separated state. The main advantage of experiments is that they show the real phenomena. However, it is quite challenging to obtain quantitative data by taking measurements from the flow field without being too intrusive. This is where computational field dynamics excel, because we can easily access to our data by extracting the flow variables from our computational grid. Nevertheless, one has to be aware of the limitations of the chosen numerical approach, the spatial and temporal discretization, and especially the turbulence modeling. An effective interaction between numerical and experimental methods is necessary in order to broaden the knowledge in a given research topic. Here, I will post a video to speak about the main elements that we are looking at. In first place, we have a lambda shock pattern which is characterized by the presence of an oblique shockwave that ends at the main shock. Its name comes from the resemblance with the Greek letter and it is a typical sign of shock induced separation in transonic flow. I have also indicated the boundaries of the supersonic region by displaying the sonic line in magenta. The incoming subsonic flow is accelerated by a subsonic compression at the leading edge while also changing its direction upwards in order to follow the air force curvature. Once it reaches supersonic conditions, this is Mach 1 at the sonic line, the flow is further accelerated thanks to a supersonic expansion. This acceleration is sustained until the flow encounters the shockwave 
and the speed goes back to subsonic conditions. However, the flow acceleration of the shockwave, in combination with the air force curvature and the feedback effects coming from the weight instabilities, causes separation of the boundary layer by inducing an adverse pressure gradient. By looking at the skin friction patterns, we can observe how the flow is initially attached over the air force surface until the shock induced separation point. After this, the flow is detached and a big zone of recirculation is formed downstream the shockwave. One can observe how the extension of these zones evolve in a cyclic way due to the upstream and downstream movement of the shockwave. Now, let's see in more detail what happens at the air force surface. On the top contour, we can see the time evolution of the pressure coefficient over the top side of the wing, and on the bottom contour, we visualize the values of the skin friction coefficient in the core wise direction. As I explained before, the distribution of the pressure coefficient give us information about the magnitude and distribution of the lift over the wing. As it increases, the levels of suction decrease and therefore there is a loss in lift. On the other hand, the contours of skin friction give us information about the direction and magnitude of the shear forces over the wing surface. Therefore, the detachment location where the flow reverses can be assumed to take place where the skin friction coefficient changes its sign. This occurs when the skin friction coefficient goes to zero. A well-designed wing operating at the right design conditions will not experience transonic buffeting. It will delay the boundary layer separation, which in turn will increase the suction area. This is obviously not the case. The flow incidence is really high and this triggers the buffeting stability. Moreover, this particular wing was not designed to provide an optimal performance but to guarantee a laminar region from the leading edge to the shock's location. If you want to know more about this test case, I recommend you to check out the European research project TFAST, where one of the goals was to study laminar shockwave boundary interactions and how to control them. Well, this is the end of my small overview on Buffett Dynamics. I hope that you have liked the video and that you have a better understanding on transonic aerodynamics. Thank you so much for your attention and see you next time!